is a Type 95 Hargo. So within its name itself, the uh, Type 95 comes from the Japanese year 2595, or for the western side, 1935. So this is when the design uh, commenced. So this tank, as far as we know, belonged to the 8th uh, Japanese Tank Regiment, or the Armoured Regiment, and it fought around Rabul. Uh, this tank was actually captured at Rabul, or surrendered at Rabul, to the 2nd 4th Australian Armoured Regiment uh, in late 1945. From there, it was brought back to Australia, underwent some mine testing, went to the Australian War Memorial for a little while. From the War Memorial, it went to, I think, Newcastle Scrapyard, or an artist by the name of Monty Webb uh, got hold of it. He actually bought this tank for 72 pounds. So in Australian dollars today, it's about $2,200. So a real good bargain basement price for this one. He kept it in his backyard for quite a while because he actually had a small military uh, museum. And now it's uh, in pride of place uh, within the museum itself. The mine testing, I didn't, I didn't know that about this one. Yeah, so with the Japanese tank itself, it's very lightly armoured. So most of the plates on here are about nine millimetres thick. They go up to about 12 on the frontal armour here, uh, which is uh, face hardened. So the belly plate is quite uh, thin in reality. So obviously when you get captured vehicles, you want to know their weaknesses. So uh, when they brought them back, they tried different styles of mines, obviously to see how that would affect the bottom of the vehicle because that's a really quick way of uh, disabling a vehicle. And how'd it hold up? Uh, not too good. There's a, <laughs> a nice big hole underneath. So as part of our restoration program, we'll re replace that and put a new panel in uh, because our purpose is to get this tank back to running condition because it still has its full drive line uh, with inside the vehicle. This is what we call a bell crank suspension. The Japanese found that when operating in Manchuria, they found that a lot of the sorghum grass would get caught up within the, the suspension itself. So they actually changed the suspension. What they did was they inverted it, so turned it, so now we're going this way. And in here, they actually put a little guide roller as well on, on each side. So we change uh, direction and motion uh, through this pivoting, uh, through this arm here. And then obviously the spring with its uh, cover attached to the uh, side of the hull uh, goes all the way through to the other end. And there's actually a really long range of movement of the suspension. So the suspension actually worked quite well. This vehicle, uh, had a uh, uh, 120 horsepower Mitsubishi air-cooled diesel engine in it. So this vehicle could actually go between 45 and 48 kilometres an hour. So fairly fast, but in the, the speed time trials they did with these and the Stuart tank, the Stuarts were slightly, about 10% faster uh, over, over a straight line. Um, but all in all, for a light tank, it was an infantry support tank as such, uh, it did its job quite well. If I'm the infantry guy at the back and I want to get the commander's attention, you ask yourself, how do you do that? I've got no telephone or anything on the back like we have these days. There's a little button on the back of the, the vehicle here that looked like another bolt. So you can see it in line. So they mm. pressed this in and it was attached to a buzzer inside the vehicle. So the commander can hear this buzzer, would get his attention, and then he can stick his head out and actually talk to the, uh, the soldiers on the ground. So very cleverly hidden uh, on the back of the vehicle. The commander himself inside, he had no intercommunications with uh, the crew itself, so he actually talked through a tube uh, down through to the driver. So very primitive uh, in the way that they uh, <laughs> operated the vehicle, but it still worked. Uh, if the Americans found out about this button, they might have uh, caused a bit of mischief. Exactly. <laughs> so the left-hand side rear of the vehicle, including the hatch on top, is where we access a lot of the components for the engine. So we have our uh, oil reservoirs, our batteries in the lower left corner as well. But a really interesting feature of this tank, there's a door. So the bow gunner mechanic could actually come through that door, but he didn't have to actually come outside of the vehicle to do any maintenance. He could do it all inside. So this is the access bay to the air-cooled engine. And if we get a burst of machine gun fire, in through here, you can actually come through and disable the engine here. So, a bit of a vulnerable weak spot, the same as the grill that we can see up the top there. A vulnerable weak spot for Molotov cocktails because oh. the vents go straight through into the engine bay. And on that side, as I said previously, we've got all our oils and batteries uh, within that area as well. The rear idler here is only held on by sort of one shaft. Um, the Americans in a video that they did put out uh, during World War II said that this was a weak spot where you can actually disable this vehicle by rifle fire. Uh, if we actually uh, shoot into it, you can actually uh, wreck sort of part of the, the suspension itself and it would uh, disable it. Turret as well, especially when we start traversing the turret, especially in this corner here, when we sort of traverse right, on the left-hand side of the vehicle, there becomes a little void between the hull and the turret. And that eventually, in that same video, they've got, they can get a, uh, 
a water, water can and actually shove it up in there and disable the travis of the turret. Uh, this is part of the exhaust system. So it's obviously been bent away. There usually is a, uh, a cover as well, which has a mesh, mesh covering. So you've got a little steel can that they put on there to obviously stop water going in through and into the, uh, the engine itself. So this will again be fixed as part of the restoration program. Generally, numbers written in white uh, on the side of the turret. So they'd be either in Japanese or you would have Arabic numbers for the actual tank number itself. I don't believe these are original numbers, but they, they could be. But then again, we would have camouflage underneath. But when it comes to the camouflage scheme of these tanks, the camouflage scheme is quite unique. They had four official camouflage schemes. The first one we're talking about from the 1930s onwards had uh, four different colours. Uh, we're talking about dark browns, light browns, like uh, green, grassy colours and sandy colours. So we had a, a combination of four colours originally. When we get to 1941, 42, we start going to only three colours. But now we're introducing a yellow stripe system on the vehicle. So with the Japanese, it was, there's a couple of trains I thought whether it was a, a good luck thing for the tank or whether it was to do with the camouflage because they're obviously operating these in a jungle condition. So we've got sunlight streaming through trees at different angles, etc. So the yellow was meant to break the tank up. So the sunlight hitting the yellow would break it up. So the yellow stripe started from the front of the vehicle, went up across the top, straight down the back, but it also went from side to the other side. Now these yellow lines joined at the turret, so they quartered the vehicle. So if you see some vehicles, some Japanese vehicles with yellow lines, generally that was from 42 back. But the thing is with the Japanese, with their colour schemes, even though they had official changes, it didn't mean repainting. So you would see early camouflage schemes in early 40s to mid 40s having the same camouflage scheme. Again, these were hand painted on, so they had nice solid lines. Some of these lines had some black outline as well. It wasn't until sort of that 44 era, I think we started going to airbrushing, so we had more feathered effects. Oh, we'll go into the armament side of the house. So we'll start with the machine guns. So the initial production variants uh, started off with a uh, Type 91 6.5 millimeter machine gun. So obviously the bow gunner sat in this and he operated that one as well. We've also got one in the turret, and I'll get you to come around because this is quite uh, in interesting for this vehicle. So we have another machine gun that sits in here in the, uh, and used by the commander. So it sits about 120 degrees to his right shoulder. So this was an infantry support tank. But if he didn't want to use the 37mm gun, which we'll talk about soon, he would rotate the turret around and just use the machine gun as well. Later variants or later production variants of this went to the 7.7mm machine gun and they sort of called it a heavy tank machine gun. Um, so they did do a change uh, through production as well. We come down the front, we look at the, uh, the business end, the 37mm gun. It's actually about 36.7mm but they rounded up. So this one had an initial muzzle velocity about 575 metres per second. So it wasn't really that fast. It could penetrate about 33 millimetres of armour at about 300 metres, so not great, so theoretically wouldn't penetrate a Stuart. Um, but along the way they did upgrade, they went to the uh, Type 97, Type 98 gun, so this had a muzzle velocity of 675 metres a second, and now we're looking at penetrating around, you know, into the 40 millimetres of armour um, at uh, just under 500 metres. So they did have an increase in, in penetration with the, uh, the upgrade of the gun. Um, they did have a HE round as well, but being, again, a, a small calibre, didn't really give it a, a big blast area, but they could use it against uh, entrenched infantry. So this is where we look at uh, the braking system and steering system of the vehicle. These were really manoeuvrable, so they had a, a tiller system, so they could actually pull fully on, on one track, brakes would go around the disc, and it could actually turn uh, on the one axis, uh, essentially. So we'd lock one track up and just turn around. So very manoeuvrable, especially in a jungle environment, which you want. For a, a light Japanese tank during World War II, as an infantry support tank, I think it did its job effectively, but obviously coming up against other armoured vehicles, uh, Western tanks didn't really fare so well. So we've got this one in the museum. It will go through the restoration process at some point. We do look at getting this vehicle running. We'll give it the, uh, the paint scheme for its time uh, when it was captured at uh, Rabul. Um, and hopefully within a few years you'll see this vehicle in lovely running condition within the museum.